Good morning and welcome to Montreal West United Church. We look a little different this morning. We're uh, having a different format this morning. And this is because we're probably gonna have some people back in the sanctuary today, but we also wanna film online. Normally we would have filmed the service the same as any other service, except that just this morning, I found out my son was exposed to COVID. So he's fine and his friend is fine. They're, they just The friend just has a bad cold. But, um, but, but, and also my son has tested negative, but just in case we decided that I would stay home today and film the service from home. So here I am, isn't it wonderful? All the technological and human resources we have in this, in our church that we're able to adapt and stay safe no matter what arises. So here I am and welcome to the church this morning. I'm so happy that you could be here. Um, in just a second, I'm gonna introduce a special minute for mission and I just say that our announcement sheet today was included with the link for this service and uh, I would just highlight what you'll be hearing more about in our minute for mission that um, I think it's a great idea for this year because it's outdoors and it's bubble protected but it's the St. James coldest uh, coldest night of the year and this is a walk through our community to raise money for St. James mission. I also want to remind you again that if you'd like to help spread vaccines to the Southern hemisphere or places, countries where they can't afford to pay for their vaccines. There are links to place where you can make those donations in our announcement sheet again this week for one more week. So those are my two announcements. And now I have the pleasure of in introducing Carolyn to share with us something very close to her heart, a special minute for mission this morning. Carolyn. Good morning. At its most recent meeting, the worship committee was thinking about various ways that our caring and reaching out to the community happens as an expression of who we are as a real community. 
we were thinking, among other things, of the Minute for Mission that happens when we are doing a special project. Minutes for Mission can talk about things like our community outreach Christmas dinner, about our Lenten project, and this past year also about a special project in Advent. The committee began to think that there are a great many people in the congregation who are involved in assorted volunteer capacities, helping out on the ground, uh, being board members, even just caring enough about an organization to contribute generously. And we were thinking that perhaps from time to time, maybe once a month, there might be a minute from mission for mission that, that was brought forward by a member of the congregation who cares deeply about some organization. And so this is the first of such. And now I'm going to change hats. I'm no longer speaking to you as chair of the worship committee, but speaking to you as a board member at the St. James Drop-In Centre. The St. James Drop-In Centre's full title is St. James Drop-In Centre for the Homeless. And homelessness can mean many things. And a slogan we like at St. James is, home is more than just four walls and a roof. Home is a place of belonging, where your individuality is recognized and as far as can be humanly possible, your needs are going to be met. So St. James Drop-In Centre strives to be exactly that, home for those who are struggling with all of the various ways that one can find oneself homeless, mental health issues, addiction, and the very problem we all know so much about it because it's in the media, of the lack of affordable housing for so many people in our community and in many others as well. So the St. James Drop-In Centre is actually a very beautiful community. It has members. We don't speak of clients or beneficiaries, we speak of members. Members because this is a true community where people really care about each other, where you become a member not because of some exclusive criteria, but by chatting with the executive director and trying to figure out to what extent this kind of community can be a place where your needs are met. This is not just about food, clothing, a little chat perhaps, that you can get in a great many kinds of drop-in centers in the Montreal area. But St. James is unique in being a community where you are a member, where people really care about you as an individual. And if the kind of activities at the St. James drop-in aren't suitable to meet your needs, then the executive director and the staff will help you find somewhere else where your needs truly can be met. So there we are, a community, a closeness, that has certainly found its challenges in this area of COVID and where a great deal of creativity has been brought to bear. One of the programs at the centre is what's known as the art room, but that's a very loose descriptor for something that has activities that you would think of as self-expression. It has activities of exploring the environment, going out taking photos, coming back talking about simply what one noticed about the urban context, all kinds of things like that that draw in people who wouldn't find a sense of community with other people who care about the same things and especially who might be looked down on by society for the reasons that they find themselves in a difficult space. So the St. James Drop-In Centre tries to be a place that feels like home that's a real community that offers, yes, the basic physical needs, but also works very hard at satisfying deep human needs for community, for understanding, for compassion, and for creativity. The art room and some other things that happen, and there isn't just a program that everybody goes through lockstep. There are ever so many ways that a person can find themselves recognized as individuals. 
Now, thinking about community, this is one thing that has suffered greatly in this time of COVID and where a great deal of adaptation has been necessary. Among other things that happen at the St. James Drop-In Centre, as in any other community or family, are big dinners for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and a few other celebratory situations. You can imagine what happened when as many as 75, 80 people who might come to such an event couldn't do it this year. What happened? Well, the group was broken down into a number of sittings. And lo and behold, that turned out to be an even better community setting as everyone got to talk to everyone else who was there. As for the regular meals that are part of the day-to-day -day program, it was developed a strategy to be takeout and even delivered by some of the staff to some of the members who had difficulty getting around physically in that kind of, of context. And yes, even the major fundraiser, Coldest Night of the Year, which you heard a bit about last week in the announcements, what Reverend Mark talked about was the way it used to be before COVID came along. So now such a fundraiser is certainly present. The enthusiasm of the people who walk on teams, who also use that as an opportunity to tell as many people as possible about what kind of caring goes on at St. James, are walking in group bubbles and talking to each other on their cell phones as they go so that they feel in touch with other people, but it's not the great big outreach as a group, but it's quite possible to do outreach in alternative ways, and there's an example. So I hope I have shared a bit of my enthusiasm about what goes on at St. James with you and that maybe some others of you will be inspired to come along, speak to the uh, worship committee or the church office about your interest in presenting something you care about as a way we enact in the community who we are as a caring community. Thank you, Carolyn. It's now time for us to begin with our prayers. Um, and I just like to say that the prayers throughout the service are taken from uh, a United Methodist website called Ministry Matters, Celebrate God's Presence, a United Church resource at knowingjesus.com. And today I've added a special prayer to our prayer time. Perhaps you heard that uh, in the community where I live, and uh, not the community where I serve the church, but the community where I live, um, a, young, a young boy, a young man, was uh, killed uh, just just yesterday, and uh, we're all in shock. And so, uh, so I'm dedicating this service to our young people today. And uh, by by chance, I uh, I had an idea to take the sermon in a different direction than I than I had originally planned. And I've added this prayer for for young people. And uh, so, please join me in uh, in this service now and in this time of prayer. Let us pray. We have gathered to worship God. We have come seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and insight. We've come to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst. We have come to offer up the seasons and the turnings of our lives and to ask God, God's help in our learning and in our growing. We have come to worship God. So let's worship God together. And now let's pray. God of blessings and woes, bless us this day with lives filled with love, caring, generosity, and deep abiding hope. We pray that the world of your prayers will one day dwell among all people and we may be instruments of your love and your grace. Open our hearts with the joy of healing a world filled with brokenness and pain in the name of the one who taught us the ways of light and love be in our worship, be in our very lives. Amen. Blessed be 
Welcome back, everybody. And I'd like to invite all the young people to gather around their computer screens or tablets uh, or smartphones. And so we can share a, move, um, a moment together before you go out to Sunday school with Mary. You did some amazing things last week. I know that you put colored bricks of ice uh, around our church, like a little hug, a little path of light. And uh, I just think it's so wonderful what you did. And I want to thank you on behalf of the church for the for the beautiful things, uh, thing that you did uh, to decorate our churchyard. And today I'd like to talk about prayer a little bit. And, um, and, and I want to talk about something else. But what I want to ask you is if you say prayers, my mom taught me when I was little to say prayers every night. And uh, she taught me this one prayer it was the first prayer she taught me. And, uh, and the prayer goes like this. There are four corners on my bed. There are four angels overhead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God bless the bed that I lie on. So that's a prayer for, for it, it's quite easy. So even, even if you're small, then you can say that prayer. You can remember that prayer. I remembered it and memorized it even when I was little. But I used to remember, I would always ask myself, who are these angels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? And it's, it's a, it was an interesting question. I actually found out Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the names of the four people who put the stories of Jesus into our Bible. The stories of Jesus are called Gospels. They're, it means the good news, the story of Jesus who taught us to love one another and to love God and to be good people and showed us what it meant to be a good person. And, uh, and then no one had phones and no one had cameras. They, all of Jesus' teachings in life, we wouldn't know anything about them except for these four amazing people each told the story and what I like, what I love the most is they each told it differently. Now, I want you to imagine something. Imagine you went somewhere incredible. Maybe you went on a vacation somewhere. Maybe you went to visit your grandparents or your cousins, or maybe you just had an amazing story. Something happened in school and you had an amazing story, but other people were part of this story too. And I want you to imagine that you're telling this story and then someone else is telling the story and someone else is telling the story and someone else is telling the story. Do you think we'd all tell it the exact same way? Do you think we'd all remember the exact same things about the story? Or would it be like one person would start telling the story and that would remind this person and then they would start telling that. And it's amazing how we each would probably notice and remember different things about that story or that vacation or trip, whatever it might be that we're talking about it. That's who Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are. They're four people who tell the same story, the story of Jesus' life, but they each tell it so differently. They each have their own way of telling it. They each noticed completely different things about the story. And so we have this amazing depth to our understanding of who Jesus was because four different people told the story, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today. A lot of the times you hear stories of Jesus. And so this is what I want you to think about. If Mary or anyone is telling you a story of Jesus, you could tell that you can ask them, is this story from Matthew, from Mark, from Luke, or from John? Who is it from? Because it's almost certain that it'll be from one of those four, four people, from those four people telling these stories of Jesus. So now you know something really interesting about the Bible, that you know that the Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they tell the Gospels, tell the story, almost everything we know about Jesus in those four stories. And so now I'll remind you again that uh, you're about to go off and have some fun in Sunday school. Don't forget to say your prayers at night. Um, there are four corners on my bed. There are four angels overhead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. God bless the bed that I lie on. I've been... I've known that prayer just about my whole life. And now I'd like to pray with you another prayer that my mom taught me around the same time when I was really little and what prayer that, as you know, we're trying to learn together. So let's play, pray the Lord's Prayer together this morning. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 
Thanks for praying with me and for listening to my story about prayers and about gospels and the Bible and Jesus. And I do hope you have a wonderful day today in Sunday school. And if you have any questions, you can always ask Mary or ask me. I love talking about church and Bible and all these, these things. So thanks for being with me today and have a wonderful day in Sunday school. Say hi to Mary for me. God bless. This morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 6, verses 17 to 26. Jesus is speaking to a large group of people come to see what he's doing and to hear him. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, "'Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. 
Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice that day and leap for joy because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. May God grant us the grace to truly take to heart these words we have just heard. Well, here I am on camera. I'm safe and taking the, the proper precautions, keeping everyone else safe. But uh, I am, uh, I am, I did imagine that this Sunday would be a little bit different. I know, uh, hopefully, we're all back in the sanctuary and we're watching this together in the sanctuary right now. Um, I wish, you know, that, uh, that it was a fully live service, but uh, I'm glad for what we have. I know we want to be back together in our community, but that said, uh, I, I am so glad that we have these services online. I'm glad we have a voice online. And who knows who we might be reaching with these online services. That just it makes me feel so excited to think, you know, who we might be reaching. I think it's important for us to continue online, even after we're finally all back together. The internet, it just seems to me, is more and more important to our future. Uh, and if it weren't for the pandemic, I don't even know if we'd be on the internet, but we are. And I think it's such a good thing why do I say that? Well, I took my son out for breakfast this week. It was, uh, I think it's important for parents to make time, especially for older kids, because it isn't always easy or even appreciated by older kids. But we just have to take time to make sure that they're uh, doing okay, maybe give them the benefit of our learning and experience. But what I learned this week was there's another reason that parents need to spend time with their older kids, and that's so that we can learn. We can benefit from their learning and experience, and they can keep us all up to date with what's happening in the world because, boy, the world is changing quickly. I used to think I was keeping up with all that's happening in the world. I watch the news. I even get a lot of my news online. However, this week I realized that no matter how hard I try, there's no way that I will ever be able to keep up with all that's happening in the world today. It's just changing too quickly, and the internet is such a big part of that. For instance, I asked my son uh, when we were having breakfast what he was planning on doing with his life, and he told me that he'd like to get into e-commerce. E-commerce. There was no e-commerce when I was in school, but at least I understood what he meant, that basically it just means he wants to run businesses online, on the internet. But then he said he was getting really interested in virtual or just NFT trading. I'm not sure if the proper term is virtual or NFT trading, but that's when he lost me either way. So. Does everyone know what virtual or what NFTs are? Well, if you do, and if you're over the age of, say, 40, then wow, I'm impressed. I think you're exceptional. You're keeping up with our changing world. You're ahead of the curve, I think. But if you have no idea what an NFT is, then I can at least offer this to you. You are not alone. They make no sense to me. And even after my son explained what they were and showed me pictures and diagrams, I still had no idea what he was talking about. An NFT is a non-fungible token. That's fungible with a, with a G, fungible. Fungible, I discovered, means interchangeable. Fungible commodities are things like money, gold, or oil. Theoretically, one ounce of gold has the exact same value as another ounce of gold. Theoretically, one barrel of oil has the exact same value as any other barrel of oil. And every loony, the coin, no matter what condition it's in, is worth exactly the same amount as any other loony, one dollar. That means they're fungible. But works of art, for example, are non-fungible because theoretically they're all unique. Paintings can't simply be traded one painting for another because all paintings are equal. Safe to say something da Vinci painted will be worth a little more than something I paint. So our two paintings aren't like two dollar coins, perfectly exchangeable. They have a unique value. Uh, value. They are non-fungible. 
So what does this have to do with the internet? Well, people are actually investing in online non-fungible goods. And here's the thing, online non-fungible goods are actually virtual things. They don't necessarily exist anywhere. They may even only really exist as computer code. And people are investing in these things. The strangest one, my son explained, you gotta, I, I don't even know if I can do this justice, but he's explaining that people are buying digital copies of moments in great basketball games. So you go to this website and find the moment that your favorite star dunked the ball or made a three pointer, and then you buy that moment. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I may not fully understand this, but in reality, the NBA owns all the rights to those videos. You're not buying publishing rights from the NBA. All you get for your money is the knowledge that on this one website, possibly started by a kid in a basement somewhere, you are recognized as owning that moment. It belongs to you on that website, but it's only on that website that you're recognized as owning that moment. So you actually, do you own anything? I guess, I guess you do because you can always sell that thing and people are actually making money, a lot of money buying and selling on these websites. And all of these virtual NFTs are brought, bought and sold with virtual currencies, the most famous being Bitcoin or Ethereum. These are currencies like British pounds or Canadian dollars, but they're generated and traded online exclusively. And the only thing giving them value is us, is people like you and me willing to give them value. You may think this is all just pretend, but Bitcoin has got, gone mainstream. It has real corporate advocates who see it as the future of money. Imagine this, if you were smart enough to buy $100 worth of Bitcoin in 2012, you would have $29 million today. A person actually bought a pizza with Bitcoin in 2010. The pizzeria in Florida agreed to take the virtual currency in return for the pizza merely in order to be able to boast that they had sold the first pizza for Bitcoin. They never even imagined it would be worth anything. But they sold that $20 pizza for 10,000 Bitcoins. Bitcoins were worth almost nothing back then. 10,000 Bitcoins are worth half a billion dollars today. That was one expensive buy. If I'm losing you, don't worry, I'm almost done. And there won't be a test or anything. This isn't going to be a sermon on e-commerce. All I'm trying to explain is that the internet is changing things so fast. And it's also like a gold rush of the, the gold rush in the 19th century, except the fast money promised by the internet doesn't even require any hard work or even getting out of bed. The way people used to invest in art or coins or jewelry, they're literally investing in virtual art, virtual coins and uh, which are nothing, basically these things break down to nothing but computer code. And young and kids younger than my son are buying NFTs of video clips or digital art online for a few hundred dollars. And just weeks later, they're selling them for six figures. I'm not joking, my son showed me an NFT, a computer generated picture of a monkey in a car that someone his age bought for $200 and sold two weeks later for $150,000 to another investor. But the reason I bring all this up today is it made me think about what people his age are learning online, especially about things like money. They seem to think that money is easier to make than any generation before them, even easier than in the gold rush. They seem to be bombarded by messages every day of kids their age building fortunes on YouTube or TikTok. And now all these stories of high school kids mining Bitcoin, which I still don't understand, or buying NFTs and poof, two, will, two weeks later, selling them for six figures. Joey said that there was a tweet that went around around New Year's and uh, he received it. It already had thousands of retweets and it said, if you are broke in 2022, then it is 100% your fault. Making money today is easier than ever. He said he received another quote some time ago that read, if you're born poor, it's your fault. It's sorry, it's not your fault. But if you die poor, it is. These are examples of this online culture that truly believes that money is so easy to make, literally just a click away. And so I understand why Joey is so excited about the future of e-commerce and NFTs, but I got very worried this week about just what he was learning online. And I also worried about how young people might be being taught to think about things like poverty and the poor especially given the fact that while 
this may be a virtual, an age of uh, millionaires around every corner. It's also an age when the gap between rich and poor is growing and uh, the middle class is disappearing. And that's a fact. Now, I need to be very clear here. My son was not advocating or even repeating these quotes about poverty. He was just telling me that they were things he had heard, along with the bombardment of stories of kids his age making millions with a few clicks of a mouse, trading what amounts to computer codes and making hundreds of thousands of dollars instantly without any work. And I think he was asking me what I thought. And that's why I was so glad that I had taken the time to talk to him to that day and why I found it so interesting when I realized what today's reading was. Today's reading is from Luke's gospel. The Bible has a lot to say about money and especially about poverty, but Luke's gospel may be the Bible's masterpiece on poverty. The gospels are also wonderfully different. Mark might be said to be most concerned with Jesus' movements and chronology of, of Jesus' actions. Mark hardly says a word about Jesus' sermons or teachings. John is so abstract, concerned with theology and philosophy and answering questions about Jesus, who Jesus is in the grand scheme of things. But Jesus' sermons, the only reason we know anything about Jesus' wonderful sermons is thanks to Matthew and Luke. But even then, look how different they both are. Matthew and Luke both tell us the story of very similar sermons. But Matthew chooses to record the Sermon on the Mount, a sermon preached from a high place. Luke situates his sermon, the one we heard read today, on a plain, a flat, even place. Notice where Luke records Jesus speaking to the poor and the hungry. Matthew hears something very different. In Luke's gospel, we hear, blessed are the poor, blessed are the hungry. In Matthew, we hear, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the poor, sorry, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. It's Luke, more than any other evangelist, who records Jesus' profound concern for the poor. Though the other evangelists hear it and understand it, Luke is the one who brings it to the forefront of his gospel and most loudly proclaims Jesus' words that the poor are blessed and loved by God, and perhaps even, in some way, the chosen ones of God. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the realm of God, and blessed are those who hunger now, for they will be filled. Luke seems to hear Jesus not only preaching to the poor, but preaching God's almost preference for the poor. Now, that would surely be confusing to those who have grown up in the age of e-commerce, the world of Bitcoin billionaires. Why would God want anyone to poor when be poor when being rich is so easy? Well, I, for one, I don't think God wants anyone to be poor exactly. The message is more complex. It's why we study these things. It's interesting that Luke specifies that the location of this sermon was not a mountaintop. It was a plain, a flat place. So all Luke's talk about wealth happens on a flat place, a flat, even place. And I think that's so important. You know, I think some good Christians who have heard this scripture misunderstood it to mean God wants us to be poor. But I don't think that's what Jesus wants exactly or is saying. If he did, then why would he say in the end that the poor would be filled and that they would find paradise in the end, that they would find salvation. I think our God is a God of plenty and abundance, a God, and God wants nothing more than for us to have everything we need. However, what Jesus may have been talking about on that plane was equality, even more than poverty. What he may have been really talking about was how unequally wealth was shared in the ancient world. A community cannot last long if the members of that community aren't basically equal, maybe not perfectly equal, but mostly equal. If some are rich and others are poor, and if that, that the gap between the rich and the poor is just a huge, a, a chasm, then the community will always be divided and broken in some way. It can't really truly be a community. Each of the evangelists has a slightly different focus in their story of Jesus, but there's a lot they agreed upon. They all agreed that Jesus' primary message was to love our neighbor. Then they each focused on different aspects of that. What Luke realized, I believe, was that where people are loving their neighbor, there cannot be large gaps between the rich and the poor. There is no love where some have too much and others are hungry. The world is certainly changing very fast, even faster than I understood it was a few days ago. My son taught me that. 
but I didn't need him to tell me that the gap between the rich and the poor today is getting larger every day. It just seems to be the direction the world is going. Perhaps everyone is so distracted by all the easy money there is to make, they aren't seeing all the poverty that is growing, increasing every day all around the world. Perhaps poverty is hard to see from behind our computer screens, each in our own homes. Another direction the world is taking is that fewer and fewer young people are going to church, which is a pity. Because I think for every message they hear online about the poor being to blame for their own poverty and money being so easy to make, I hope they hear one about God's love for the poor, God's call for us to love our neighbor and to live in good communities. I'm sad that we are, aren't fully back in our sanctuary this week, but I am feeling happier than ever that the pandemic has forced us to go online because I'm realizing more and more how important it is, for, it is for us to be online. I don't even know if we'd be online if it weren't for the pandemic, but now we are and I'm glad. Our online ministry is important. The internet is changing life as we know it, especially for our young. And I just hope Bitcoin billionaires are not the only voice that our young people are hearing. Amen. I don't have the plate here, but it's time for us now to dedicate and bless our offering. I want to thank everyone for their support online, those in the pews, putting their donations in the plate beside the door, everyone who's been supporting our community and our ministry. And now it's time for us to dedicate these gifts to God. Let's pray. 
Loving God, as we come to present our offerings at this table, we remember your generous hospitality and our calling to feed those dismissed from the world's tables, that they may no longer feel hungry or alone. Loving God, God of all peoples and God of all places, we present our offerings that they may be used to extend your liberating reign. With them, we offer our varied ministries that each one of us may be part of your voice, your answer, your hearing of the cries of the world. And so we dedicate these gifts to the work of the church. In Jesus' name, amen. And now continuing to pray, pray I remind you that our prayers take on a special meaning when we pray together. God hears our prayers wherever we are. And even if we're all alone, even if we feel God is far away, God hears every word of our prayers. But when we pray together, our prayers do take on a special quality. So let's pray together. Loving God, like the Israelites in the wilderness, we too have known your love and experienced your care and provision. You invite us to extend that love to the world around us, to care for others as deeply as we care for ourselves. And so we bring the needs of our world before you now. In your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for the many who do not have enough, enough food to eat or shelter to keep warm, enough employment or money to pay their bills, enough medicine or medical care. Love, loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We also pray for those who have more than enough, but who still struggle to find meaning and purpose in life, who indulge in dangerous or self-serving activities to dull their pain or loneliness. We pray for all who are lonely or isolated. Loving God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, your grace reaches out to all of us. You call us to live as citizens in heaven, working together with one heart and mind. Strengthen us to live in a matter, manner worthy of the good news we have received, offering our lives in service of your kingdom, where the last are first, and the first are last, and there is grace enough for all. Before we end our prayers today, we also pray for our youth, for those navigating a quickly changing world. We pray for the wondrous gifts they give us, how they teach us and inspire us and give us hope. And we pray that they find loving God the way. We pray and thank you for young people. And we pray for you to be in their lives. May they learn to walk in spirit and truth and trust in your word, knowing that your grace is sufficient for all their needs and requirements. Keep them, we pray, from being influenced by the tempting things of the world and the paths that seem so attractive but lead nowhere. Help them to see past easy answers, see through easy answers. Give them grace and wisdom as they face the challenges of life and keep them humble in heart and teachable in spirit. May they learn love of their neighbor and find themselves by serving others. We pray for the young person who lost his life yesterday in a senseless act of violence. And for all young people and all people in similar and even in different circumstances, we pray for this world, for the light and for the hope and for people to just hear loving God. We pray that you hear our prayers and we know that you do. Amen. We. 
Well, here we are at the end of our service. This service has been different again from our other services. We've tried many things, but once again, we've continued. We have, we renew, we give thanks for having a, a presence in the sanctuary this morning, but also for maintaining our presence online. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for to Kevin and Roy. Thank you to Samantha and Samuel, the choir and Stevie. Thank you for Carolyn this morning for our reading and our minute for mission. Thank you, loving God, for giving us this community and this time to worship and connect and be led and guided by you, by your light. And my friends, until we're together again, may the grace of God, the love of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit bless you now and always until we're together again. Go in peace. Amen.